I'm going to warn you a little bit at the outset of this lecture. Um, it is one of the more technical, more heavy on the molecular biology side of what we're talking about. I don't want to freak you out too much, but to some extent that's what this image is designed to demonstrate some of the amazing complexity that's going on when we have interaction between uh, molecules. Now, this is looking at a cellular signaling pathway with membrane-bound proteins, um, the intracellular proteins, and the nuclear proteins, and some of the complex interactions where lines represent an interaction between one protein and another. And in reality, there are these incredibly vast networks that maintain um, proper cell function, allow cells to do new things if they need to, and these are involved in development also. However, usually so that we can visualize it, we break these into components. And one of the easiest ways to visualize a very complex network is to look at it instead of every single connection, look at the hierarchies. And a hierarchy is just one chain in that network where one gene impacts a second gene, impacts a third gene, and then so on down the line. And so these hierarchies are very, very important, and they also somewhat simplify these very, very complex networks of interacting genes. So we introduced this in the last lecture, right, where we have a hierarchy, we have some sort of a regulator that uh, then initiates a pathway either through a signal and a receptor and then a transcription factor, or if the regulator is itself a transcription factor, we can skip over this pathway, and that regulator itself, the transcription factor, would go into the cell and start the next um, step in the process that is going on. And for most of our toolkit genes, they themselves are regulators. They themselves are the transcription factor. And so they, the gene product needs to get into the cell it's going to target. And this usually happens through simple diffusion of the mRNA, which is then translated into the protein or the protein itself, which diffuses through tissue, gets into the cells it needs to target, and then is able to do whatever it um, is adapted to do. Okay. Now, within each of these hierarchies, sometimes it's helpful in these developmental sequences for us to visualize it to also designate batteries. And batteries are groups of genes that are all signaled at about the same time by the same upstream or the same battery of upstream um, regulators. So here we have three genes that are all turned on by this one transcription factor, and so we would refer to those as a battery of genes. Okay, So this entire thing is a hierarchy, and at some levels in the hierarchy we may have a battery of genes rather than one gene. And so these could then feed back into it or branch out. So you could see as we expand each step of this hierarchy, we are going to get more and more network-like. But again, for our purposes, so we can comprehend it and visualize it, break it down into more meaningful components, we won't look at the entire network. And in many cases, the entire network isn't completely worked out anyway. But we're going to focus on critical components of, the, of these um, networks, the hierarchies, and talk about them. Now, we're going to look at how segmentation occurs. Now, the nice thing about this is we have already introduced this hierarchy to you. Okay, and so even though we're going to get a little bit more into it, a little bit more detailed, you already know this hierarchy. This is the hierarchy of genes that patterns the anterior to posterior axes of the insect and eventually ends up in segments and then later down the line, each of those segments is differentiated into all those differential components. And so we'll review that hierarchy that you already learned in a previous lecture. We'll review it in just a little bit. So I don't want to introduce, you know, five, six, seven hierarchies. We'll focus on just one or maybe probably just this main one and then realize that there are many, many others that if we were studying a different patterning process, we need to learn a different hierarchy of genes. And so after segmentation occurs, we have a more specific organization of the regions, but realize that segmentation itself is a general organization of undifferentiated tissue into repeated organized modules. And then after those modules, those segments are patterned, then we can begin to um, signal for different appendages. You know, are you going to grow a leg on this segment or are you going to grow an antenna? Are you going to grow a mouth part? And in the arthropods, all of their appendages, whether they're antenna, 
whether they're mouth parts, whether they're swimming legs or walking legs, or in crustaceans we have these pleuropods, which are um, like little swimming or gill-like structures on the posterior part of the abdomen. Whatever those appendages are, they all come from the same homologous ancestral, just general appendage. And so as evolution occurred, as we have new gene networks being activated in new tissues and natural selection working on them if they're beneficial, we end up with differential patterning in different parts of the body that are controlled by these upstream genes in the hierarchy. Okay? And so the limbless abdomen in insects, which we learned about, you did that in some detail in the Lewis et al. paper and in that Ron Shogan et al. paper, right? We learned how the limbless abdomen in the insects, basically how to make an insect, was um, pretty much just two genes that changed where they were expressed and their downstream targets. They tar began to target distillus. They began to repress distillus, and so we get a limbless abdomen. Now, there's also a ton of work that's been done on wings, and uh, wings themselves are still somewhat of a little bit of work that needs to be done, but we're understanding them more and more. Um, but insect wings are a really cool example that, uh, that are, it's a difficult prob uh, problem to figure out exactly where they came from because there's no clear ancestral progenitor to the wing, right? It's really kind of a, a true novelty if you only look at the fossil record. And so we're hoping to find clues and signals in the genetic networks that might link it to other structures. And so we'll talk about wings at a later date, but realize wings are one of the things that would be targeted by this hierarchy eventually to grow wings on the proper segments of insects. Okay, so holometabolous insects, we've done a lot of this in the lab. These are insects that go through complete metamorphosis. And it's worth pointing out that most of the work to date is done on holometabolous insects. And even more so on Drosophila, which is really a, even for a holometabolous insect, is a little bit bizarre because their larvae look like worms. Where larvae of other holometabolous insects like ants and, and beetles and butterflies, right, which are caterpillars, all of those other important holometabolist or orders have insects that, although different from the adult, still maintain pretty much most other than wings and, and genitalia. They have many of the adult insect morphologies where the larvae of flies don't. They just kind of look like worms with only a few very rudimentary parts that you look at it. So yeah, it's an insect. They have segments still, so they're obviously arthropods. They have internal features and other features that if you knew um, insects very, very well, you'd say, okay, yeah, it's an insect, but it really doesn't look a whole lot like one. And so with that little caveat in mind, we need to realize that what we see in Drosophila might be a product of their evolved specialized life form uh, rather than just the general pattern for building an insect. And so we sometimes need to take what's going on in Drosophila with a grain of salt. Now, with that said, in addition to looking very different, there's this interesting feature of Drosophila where the um, larvae have imaginal disks. And imaginal disks are like little structures in waiting. So they are patterned during embryogenesis, but then they just kind of freeze in time. So they're little groups of cells that get some very early initial genes patterning them, but then it's almost like the pause button is hit, and hit, hit. And then all through the larval development, those imaginal disks are just sitting there waiting and waiting. And then finally, when the larva gets big enough and it's ready to become a pupa, right? So that's the next stage. They didn't picture it here, but the pupa is almost like a second embryogenesis where we have very radical, massive revision of the larval body type into the adult body type. When I was a kid, my mom bought me this book about, you know, the very hungry caterpillar, right, which eats and eats and eats and then turns into a butterfly. And that's maybe the most um, popularly known example of this pupation are the chrysalis of, of caterpillars. That's just another name for pupa. But the caterpillar goes through revision, the fruit fly larva goes through revision, beetle larva, um, ants, bees, and wasps, they have larvae that go through this dramatic revision. And so these imaginal disks in the fruit fly, which have just been sitting there waiting and waiting, suddenly are activated, and they become legs and wings and reproductive structures and all the other things that are in the adult that we really don't see in the larva. So although there are no external indicators of many adult features in the larval fruit fly, there are internal bits of tissue that if you can identify and if you can look at the gene expression can give you some hint about future leg development or future wing development or any changes that might have been made. 
And so they're not an ideal model because of their highly modified lifestyle uh, and their ad adaptation to this kind of extreme environment where they're just taking advantage of like fruit fall, right? You have to uh, live really, really quick and pupate really quick and get out in just an, a, a couple of days uh, to take advantage of that uh, rotten fruit resource. And so they have this highly modified lifestyle for that. And other flies too, maybe not as extreme and as fast as fruit flies, but they do, like they're taking advantage of dead animals or they're taking advantage of dung, right? Droppings of other animals. And those are resources that are, are very, very energy rich, kind of gross, but they can get lots of energy from them, but they're ephemeral. They don't last a very, very long time. And so they've got a very modified. So just take that as a grain of salt. But with that said, there's still lots of things that we can glean from fruit fly development that are going to be generally applicable across insects and a few that are even more highly conserved and are applicable across all bilateria or maybe even uh, all animals. Okay, so here is a um, reminder of this hierarchy that we already introduced to you. Now, the only difference in this hierarchy and the one we told you is they've separated uh, two different batteries of pair rule genes. We introduce these as one battery. So some people like to separate it, but for simplicity's sake, we will just keep uh, pair rule genes as one step in this hierarchy. And then below this, of course, we would have the activation of the um, Hox genes. And so that would be our fifth step in the hierarchy. And notice at some of these steps, right, the maternal genes, we talked about um, bicoid, right, which is listed right here as one of the, the genes here. And then the next step are the gap genes. And at each step here, we're only looking at one of the expression patterns, a diagram of one of the expression patterns of these genes. So this would be the expression pattern of bicoid. And then all the other genes, in addition to bicoid, help turn on a gene here. I think this one is a crupple. Um, but again, there are multiple ones that are going to come on in different patterns. And realize patternings are going to get complicated. So we've kind of simplified it by just showing you one of the pathways for each of these. Now notice this is a complex diagram, much more network-like. It's not as scary as the one I showed you ahead of time. And I don't ask you to memorize these. I don't ask you to, um, uh, well, you've got open notes and open uh, uh, lecture tests, right? So as long as you're not taking too long to look up any of these resources, you can use this as a resource on an exam. But what I do expect you to be able to do is look at a diagram, this exact diagram, or one like it, and be able to tell me what's going on. And notice there are going to be some loops where um, you might have, uh, and we don't show feedback here for simplicity, but there is some feedback. But notice a very common feature of genes in the same battery is that they repress, uh, either one represses the other, or sometimes there's mutual repression. So notice Hunchback and Krupple both repress expression of one another. And that's what that little line with the T at the end means. If there's a line with an arrowhead at the end, that means that that gene targets this one and increases its expression level, basically turns on expression of that gene. If we have a line like this one with a T at the end, that means that that one represses. And notice that often there is either, you know, so both bicoid and, and caudal together turn on giant. So if both of those are present, we get really high expression levels of giant. Bicoid and nanos have this competitory uh, impact on, on this gene hunchback. And again, I don't expect you, some of these genes you may be more familiar with, I don't expect you to know all of them, but HB is the abbreviation for hunchback. And so we have this competitory interaction, and so depending on levels, we could get hunchback turned on or turned off. If we have bicoid, it would be turned on. If we have nanos, it would be turned off. If we have both of them, then it might depend on the levels of these where one could overcome the other as to whether hunchback is turned on a little bit or turned on a lot, and, and that, that can vary. So there's a lot of, of stuff going on here. And notice the other interesting thing that we often have is that each level, right, each of these batteries of genes will often impact more, well, they'll have this pleiotropic effect on a downstream target where both caudal and bicoid impact the phenotype of giant. Both bicoid and nanos impact the phenotype of hunchback. Um, both hunchback and crepple and giant all impact the phenotype of even skipped, right, which is one of the pair rule genes. So just be aware of that, and again, I don't want you to memorize this or know all the details, but fairly simple things. It gets a little bit complex downstream, but if I give you a little bit of a simplified version of this and say, if I increase the expression of caudal, what happens to giant? Well, that's an easy one, right? If I in pre increase caudal, that means, based on this arrow, that giant expression is going to increase also. 
But you should also be able to say, oh, what happens if I increase the expression of caudal? What happens to the expression of E? With all other things, not worrying about all the rest of it. Well, caudal goes up, giant goes up, but because giant turns off Eve, Eve is going to go down or be even, even completely repressed, so it's no longer expressed. So by increasing caudal in the, gene, or in the cells where caudal is expressed, Eve expression would go down or be completely turned off. Okay, so realize, and there's, that it can get complex as we're going, and then realize it's very, very complicated. We have very fine control in different areas. Okay, now notice this in the pair rule level here, this third level, these stripes represent um, the early patterns for segmentation where we're beginning to divide, divide the body up into segments. And this represents one gene. It's even skipped. So even skipped is turned on in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, probably more, but for simplicity's sake, um, in seven different stripes along the body. So the question is, how do we turn on Eve in seven different places? And the key is that Eve has more than one way to be turned on. Now this diagram, it's somewhat simplistic, so we'll look at it here in a little bit in these next diagrams. So let's go back to our very early um, discussion about the anterior to posterior patterning. So right now, we are looking at maternal genes. And we're really only going to focus on two of them. But realize there are others that are present, uh, like caudal, which is a maternal gene, CAD. And then a hunchback, which is made very, very quickly by um, the zygote, by the developing embryo. But we're really only going to focus on bicoid and nanos and their impacts, but realizing there is some more complexity here to this level. So you already understand that bicoid is produced by the mother and deposited in the anterior end. Nanos, in a like manner, is produced by the mother, but is only deposited in the posterior side. So we have this immediate differentiation of the front anterior and the back posterior uh, axes of the developing fruit fly embryo. And then over time, they diffuse a little bit. So initially, we have this very steep uh, diffusion curve where you go very far from the front, and there's no bicoid, no measurable bicoid. You go very far from the back, and there's no me measurable nanos. But eventually, so hunchback and caudal are everywhere. Again, just kind of a side note. Okay, And so here is a portion of that network that I showed you earlier. Here are the maternal genes. Here's their impact on hunchback, which is, again, a zygotic gene. So they're causing it to be turned on. So bicoid turns on hunchback, nanos turns it off. So it's only a, probably a little area where we're getting reduced levels of hunchback, but we're going to be able to start to see differences in hunchback. So here we go. Let's look at the diagram. So this is eventually what occurs. So because nanos, um, remember, represses hunchback, notice that hunchback's levels, which are kind of in this uh, blue-green color, uh, they begin to drop at this level, but they're increased at this level as hunchback is turned on by bicoid, right? And bicoid had diffuses out, so we get a little bit more of a uh, gradual um, diffusion gradient of, of that maternal gene bicoid. But notice that we've set up, just by this fairly simple, fairly simple process at the beginning, we set up quite different areas of the anterior to posterior axis where we have one area with high hunchback and high bicoid. We have one area with fairly low bicoid, but still very high hunchback. And we have this area where all four of them are low, and so lots of areas in between, okay? And again, you don't need to memorize this, but you, can, you should be able to glean that from the diagram, right? Nanos represses expression of hunchback. You can say, well, I knew that because I looked at the diagram here. Hunchback then re represses the expression of caudal. Now, we don't have it on the diagram, and so realize that's some of the simplicity, but hunchback feeds back in, and so there's going to be some of this positive and, in this case, negative feedback, where the products of one level might feed back in and slow down, or sometimes even speed up, but that's less common. But they're going to slow down um, the process, and so that's a feedback loop in a network. So the key to getting Eve, right, even skip, turned on in all these different places is to have multiple independent regulatory elements. Now, hopefully that makes some sense to you. But if not, let's review and, and just be exactly clear. Because I know there's a lot of new terminology and sometimes visualizing these in your head can be a little bit tricky. Okay, so we're just going to look at one of the even skipped stripes. And here is how it is turned on. So there are multiple regulatory elements in front of the even skip gene. 
we have one of those regions that controls the second stripe, one of them that controls the third stripe, and then there are others that aren't pictured that, that control the other stripes. And so with the combination, and notice there is one, two, three, four, five sites for Bitcoin to bind, one site for Hunchback to bind, three sites for Giant, and four, maybe they only have, they have a funny label, but only three uh, diagram sites of Krupple. And so depending on the level of these genes, we can turn on Bicoid in stripe two. In stripe three, there are other combinations and even completely different binding sites for different regulatory elements that turn on stripe three. So the right combination, which in this case is very high Bicoid and you know medium strength, or sorry, very high hunchback and medium strength Eve, but pretty much none of these giant and crupple genes, right? So giant and crupple genes would repress distillus, uh, Bicoid and hunchback, uh, they at, uh, uh, increase expression. And so we end up with a stripe created there by the right combination of upstream genes. A very different diagram would be in place for this number three stripe, right? Where we might have different levels in that have diffused out. So by the time we get to this number three stripe, we're going to have very, very low levels of Bicoid. We're going to have maybe dropping off levels of, of um, hunchback. And so maybe there's, and notice that Krupple may be expressed there. And so there may be a different combination, uh, maybe a third one that overrides repression of Krupple or something like that. And again, I don't, I'm not going to ask you what are all the genes necessary and at what levels to turn on expression of um, the segment, uh, the pair rule gene that, that differentiates segment two. I'm not going to ask you to do that. That's like a graduate postdoctoral level study, right? But I do want you to understand that there are m more than one ways to turn on a gene, and that is because of these individual regulatory elements. Now, this should be a fairly easy question if you understand all the concepts. Are these individual regulatory elements here that control stripe 2, are they necessary for Eve expression? Well, the fact that we have other regulatory element regions that control expression of that gene and help to turn it on in other areas of the body tells you right away, no, stripe, the ones in this area are not necessary. They are together sufficient because they do it on their own. They're sufficient for turning it on, but they're not necessary because there are other ways to turn on this gene. Okay, And so these multiple control regions for a gene then are allowing it to come on by different pathways through these complex genetic networks. Okay, So although these elements here that we've diagrammed in this region that turn on Eve expression in what we're going to call stripe or segment two, although they are sufficient for expression of Eve and Skip, they turn it on just on their own without any help from outside regulatory elements. They are not necessary because there are other pathways by which it can be done. Okay, so general concepts, many of these are review, but these are all play roles in whether or not, you know, uh, this is a here on the right, it's a very simplified diagram, but realize it's much more complex. So there's often a concentration dependent response where you'll build up and build up and build up a transcription factor and nothing will happen, then certain, suddenly once you reach a, trans, uh, a threshold level, then that gene will come on at a fairly high rate. That activators and repressors can work together, and so we can get complex control of downstream genes based on the different levels of uh, those transcription factors that are either turning it on or turning it off. And so we're going to call this in general combinatorial regulation which means that many upstream genes, combinations of repressors and um, act activators at different levels are all going to work together to uh, cause the next step of genes. And this is done by them interacting with these independent, meaning one doesn't rely on the other, right? These independent cis-regulatory elements. Okay, so again, this is complex, but general overview of, of how we build an insect with the segmentation hierarchy being the only one that we're really going to do in detail. If we're looking at, well, maybe uh, how do we get what is at the dorsal side and the ventral side, that's going to be a different set of networks. And so this hierarchy gets more and more complex at each sta step. And I want to make that clear because it could be a middle, little misleading from this diagram, right? It looks like it's getting simpler and simpler and simpler. Well, we're doing this just because we want to focus in on this last gene, which patterns the polarity of the gene. But at each step, there's more and more and more parts of this network that just aren't shown in this diagram. Okay, And again, dorsal to ventral, 
we'd have a whole new set of genes. So now we've got snail, twist, rhomboid, toiloid, decapuint, pelagic, zirconult. You know, you don't need to memorize those. All I want you to know is that the same principles are applied. A hierarchy, starting with maternal genes and then a next step, if they're not called um, gap genes or pair rule genes, they're different names, but we won't learn them. But there's a whole different hierarchy of genes that are used to pattern anterior to posterior. And if we were to look at the um, proximal to distal that are being patterned as appendages are growing out, we would see a, another set of genes that are being used. Um, so just realize that and realize that um, we have three axes, all patterned by different uh, hierarchies of genes. Okay, And so the Hox genes are really central to this because they uh, form kind of this interesting uh, transition point where we move from general patterning of repeated units, you know, first very general from anterior to posterior, then segmentation, then the direction of the, of the segments, the polarity of the segments, and finally at Hox genes, that's where we really see um, segments becoming different from one another. And so the level of Hox genes that are turned on by all these upstream genes are then going to target downstream genes that say, hey, you are going to be a thorax. So let's turn on all the genes and start building legs right on an insect because there are legs on a thorax. And if we're in the mesothorax, uh, which is in the middle, right, then we're going to grow, if you're in uh, the winged insects, then we're going to grow wings. And so there's a signal there somewhere in all that complexity also that targets the first initial gene that says, hey, you should build a wing right here. And so all of those combinations generate a, a, a correct patterning for the insect. And so we need to, and we're not, uh, I, I hope, again, this is going to scare you a little bit. When I say we, <coughs> excuse me, I'm referring to people who are doing research and want to understand these. So the researchers need to look at all of these details and maybe even break down and find all of the binding sites for these different um, regulatory genes, right? The one regulators that are turning on and turning off these target genes. And so here are some of the regulatory elements that are involved in the gene UBX. Remember, if we want to study wing development, and we'll eventually even look at wing modification, then we might want to look at one, this is only one of those regulatory regions. Here's another one that has multiple regulatory elements. And so it's a very, very complex process that can be very difficult to tease apart and understand in fine detail. But that's okay, because the purpose of this class is not to give you all those molecular biology details and have you memorize networks and, you know, take you through complex exercises of predicting what would happen in this intact network if we changed one thing. That's the realm of molecular biology. And if you take in a class in molecular biology, like um, one from Dr. Kennery, You'll know, and it always makes my head hurt. I'm not a molecular biologist because it's amazing the complexity that's there and that, you know, for people that can hold in their heads those well-studied things. And so Dr. Kinnery knows many, many molecular networks, but there are so many that there are other ones where she would be completely lost just because it's too much for any one person, okay? And so it's more than we need for this class, but those general things and the general outline of that anterior to posterior hierarchy you should be familiar with know how to read the arrows and the T-bars that are coming from that and what they mean, and even make simple predictions if you were given a hierarchy of what would happen in one uh, to one target gene if we changed expression of one of the upstream genes.